The fifth Sunday of Great Lent is dedicated to the memory of St. Mary of Egypt. St. Mary, who was born in the late 4th century, she died in 522. At the age of 12, she ran away from home to Alexandria. And she told later to the priest Osma that she lived for 17 years, a life of great sin. She gave herself to every carnal passion. When she went to view the Holy Cross out of curiosity, a great miracle occurred and she was prevented from entering the church by an unseen force. She repented and dedicated herself to an icon of the Holy Theotokos, pleaded with the Holy Theotokos, and she was led out into the desert where she repented and fasted for 47 years. She lay with her face in the dust. Many miracles occurred as she repented and was purified by God. So St. Mary of Egypt is presented to us at this time in Lent as a reminder of God's mercy and forgiveness, but also the nature of repentance. But St. Mary of Egypt isn't just an image of repentance in general, but very specifically of carnal passions, sexual sins. There is so much confusion about human sexuality in our age today, perhaps more so in our age today than any other. First of all, we may say in the animal kingdom, sex is for procreation, reproduction. There are seasons when animals may reproduce. But this is not the nature of sexuality for human beings. Human sexuality is something far greater than simply reproduction. This is a purpose far more mysterious and greater than anything in the animal kingdom. Sex within marriage is blessed. The mystery of the marriage bond, the union of a man and woman, is such that it, it reflects something of Christ's union with his church, his bride. And sex plays a part in this. And of course, we must apply a certain degree of discernment when we say these things. But sex inside marriage is completely different to sex outside of marriage. There is a great example to give us an insight into how this is so different, how an action or behavior or something we do can be very different in one context to another. Think of a soldier on the battlefield. A soldier who may sadly have to kill to defend his, his home, his nation and so on. A soldier may kill on the battlefield in warfare and be honored for his bravery. But if a man wanders around and kills on the streets during peacetime, it is a great evil and he will be locked away at least. So killing on the battlefield, though a great tragedy, may be very different to killing in the streets. And so it is with sex. Sex inside marriage is blessed. In his letter to the Hebrews, St. Paul says, it is a blessing, there is no sin, no defilement in the marriage bed. But God will judge adulterers and fornicators. Sex outside of marriage def defiles us, defiles us both in body and spirit. It defiles this honorable representation of the union between Christ and his church. And so all sex of any kind outside of marriage defiles us in both body and soul, defiles the very image of the love between Christ and his bride, the church. Let us be clear, fornication wounds, wounds the soul just as much as adultery and all the other sexual sins. But Christ sets a higher calling than simply not to sin in behavior, in our actions. Very often you will hear people talk about the, the demand of the Old Testament, the laws of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and so on as though they were far more demanding than the calling to be a Christian. And this is a mistake because 
Here in this example of sexual sin, we see Christ setting a higher standard, a calling to a greater thing than even the Old Testament set before us. For Christ says to us, whosoever looks at a woman in the street with lust commits adultery in his heart. So Christ says, look, God isn't just interested in your behavior, but as we've been saying throughout this Lent, God is concerned with the condition of our heart. A reminder to us that when we fast, when we pray, when we prostrate, these things are good. But God looks to the very nature, the condition of our heart. And so it is with sexual passions. God calls us to be purified in the heart, not to allow these desires and passions to dwell, not to feed them. And of course we are surrounded by a culture that, that seeks to profit from these passions. Advertising, movies, music will cultivate, stimulate these kinds of passions in order to sell us things, in order to stir up a passion that they then promise to gratify. We're being manipulated by all of these, these media and we must guard ourselves, protect our eyes and our ears from allowing these influences to enter us because they will stir up the heart to evil. The Church Fathers make it very clear to us how we can defend ourselves against both the outward actions and the inner passions of sexual sin. And it is all related to the body. First of all, the Church Fathers say gluttony will stir up sexual passions. Gluttony incites carnal passions. Gluttony, of course, is both a, a symptom and a cause of these kinds of passions. And along with excessive eating, excessive sleep, lying around in bed for too long, can stir up and allow these passions to grow within us. In fact, the the Church Fathers talk about a group of sins, a group of passions called excitable passions. And, and sexual carnal passions are simply one part of these excitable passions. Another group of sins are, of course, to do with the temper and anger, lack of self-control. When we have no self-control over the body and its desires, this then allows the passions of desires and anger to stir up within us. And of course, again, excessive drinking of alcohol can allow these passions to be stirred up within us and to grow. They actually stimulate carnal desires within us. All three of these things are about control of the body. But the Church Fathers warn us that even if we are to fast greatly, even if we're to sleep just a few hours a day, even if we are to abstain completely from alcohol. What really lies at the root of mastering these passions is humility. The willingness to, to recognize our inability to face these things alone. That we have no self-reliance, but we throw ourselves entirely on God and His grace. There is, of course, also a humility that reminds us that even when we master, even when we are victorious over these passions, we mustn't imagine that we have conquered them completely and we can ignore them and forget them. We must maintain our God. And God sometimes will allow people to fall, to humble us. There is a saying in the Church Fathers that God prefers a humble defeat over a proud victory. But also we must remember again, taking this image of the soldier, a soldier who realizes he's going to be overcome and, and die in battle. If he maintains his struggle, if he faces the fight and dies heroically, he will be honored. But if a soldier panics and flees, he will be called a coward. Dishonor will fall upon him. And so it is with the passions. Even if 
God withdraws his grace. We must struggle on. We must not allow defeat to cause us to panic and flee in cowardice. We must fight to the end. Even when the odds seem to overwhelm us, continue to fight to the very end. And so God will honor us. We are not to lose hope. St. Mary of Egypt repented for 47 years. 47 years of weeping over her sins. When she got to 40 years, when she got to 45 years, she didn't say, enough, I'm defeated. I've wept enough, look at me. No, she continued on to the very end, even to her miraculous death. This is the true nature of repentance, that we are to not lose heart, we are not to lose hope, we are to repent and struggle to the very last breath of our life. And even if God does withdraw his grace for a while, even if we feel that we are victorious over these passions, we are to know that in everything that God does for us, everything, without exception, God does all for our salvation. God continuously works in our lives to draw us to him, to help us, to strengthen us, to humble us. In everything that God does, he works for our salvation.